Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Got something interesting for you today. It's a PA amplifier from a train, not a toy train, like a real train here in Sydney. People in Sydney may notice the city rail or state rail or whatever it's bloody well called these days um, symbol. These are used in our trains. You've heard them before. If you've been on Sydney trains, you know, next stop central, all the stations do whoop whoop. So that's, you know, that muffled sound, it comes from one of these amplifiers. Should be interesting, lots of high power stuff, it's got to drive, you know, a whole bunch of uh, speakers on the train. So we'll look into the design aspects of it as well. And we'll get some really good design insight from this. I <laughs> think we're gonna like this one. So you know what we say here on the EV blog, don't turn it on, take it apart. Now, normally um, it would come with the cover and would take it apart, but the cover's already off this thing. Now, normally, if you're really lucky, you'll find a schematic inside one of your products, but I found something a hell of a lot better in here. We've got the original designer. Ta-da! <laughs> it's Doug, Doug Ford. Hey, it's Doug, you, you designed this beast. I designed this beastie back in 1992, so these are now, 20 years old mm -hmm. and still rattling around in Sydney trains. Literally. I believe so. And <laughs> to the best of my understanding, there are between 1,200 and 1,500 of these being manufactured. In fact, the most recent batch that was manufactured was an additional 50 units about two or three years ago. They're so still made. They're still made, they're still in use and still pretty damn reliable. And you can tell us all about the design of this beastie because you designed it from scratch. Yep, except we ran out of scratch and had to use metalwork instead. Three rack unit. Three rack unit high. Yep, 19 inch standard rack mount. Mm -hmm. You can probably tell by the front panel over here that it's got two distinct amplifier sections in there. One for public address and one for crew intercom and mm -hmm. emergency. And what we might do is backtrack a little bit to the specifications of why we had to design such a complicated beastie for something that's just a power amplifier. Fire. It just, yeah. Well, it's a little bit more than just a power amplifier. It's got a few extra frills in there and a few criteria that had to be met in the design. Excellent. So let's go back in time, way back. Okay, first of all, let's kick off with uh, how trains operate in Sydney, Australia. Different countries have different standards. We have heavy rail, by the way. We are one of the few, if people don't know, Sydney is one of the few cities in the world that actually runs heavy rail directly into the city instead of a, what do you call it, one of those metro services, you know, the quicker, smaller, lighter trains. We have heavy rail. Anyway, I'm sure you can look that up on Wikipedia. It's a lovely drawing, Doug. Oh, yes, indeed. Terribly accurate. <laughs> Dreadfully accurate. <laughs> Okay, our train system runs from 1500 volt DC overhead lines. Mm -hmm. Our silver trains are generally configured so that we get a motor car with Pantec. So these are the silver, yep. the traditional silver trains which went from what vintage are they? Oh, I don't know. Late 70s? Yes, yeah, 70s onwards. Late 70s onwards? Yeah. Are the ten new Tangaras? Uh, all the same, all the new Millennium train. These amplifiers Millennium. don't go into the Tangaras yep. or the Millennium right. trains or any of those. Uh, they called them the Millennums because the trains were lemons because they, when they went in the tunnels, it, tunnels had a significant gradient on the track, I believe, and then they draw Drew, drew too much current and they couldn't get up the you know, <laughs> they weren't specced right so anyway that was a bit of a failure on part of city rail or whatever they call themselves anyway these are the silver trains yeah. all right and we have everyone in sydney is familiar with those uh what, what are called pantex that pick up the 1500 volt mm -hmm. dc uh, and in each motor car set we've got uh, big inverter motor drivers which and also circuitry which drives big 120 volt battery banks. Now, for every motor car set, there's also a trailer car. Then we'll get usually another trailer car and then another motor car set with its Pantec and 
drive and battery set, etc, etc. And then that can be twice as long or three times as long? Yes. Either two car sets, four car sets, six car sets, mm -hmm. eight car sets, but they're always in pairs of a motor car mm -hmm. and a trailer car. Got it. Okay, they're all cross-linked by rather large connectors which circulate things such as uh, commands from the driver, let's say the train's going that way, so we've got the driver in there. It's going to transmit motor speed controls from that motor inverter down to this one down here, mm -hmm. etc, etc. Et uh, there are public address signals that are circulated amongst the train. There are intercom signals so that a driver here can talk to a, uh, a guard who might be resident in the guards compartment down here. There's quite a lot of signals. I think that there's uh, some uh, 20 or more wires within these rather large connectors. Are they used for existing other stuff? You don't have to piggyback signals on them uh, or anything like that? Yes. <laughs> there are okay. now. <laughs> right. I've opened a can of worms, have I? Oh, yes, indeed, because <laughs> long ago they ran out of conductors in the wires, particularly now that they also have to transmit things like door open and close. Right. Commands. Yep. Uh, there's also now a lot of data signalling uh, from destination signs up the front and down the back. Got and it etc etc mm -hmm. there's quite a lot of data superimposition and indeed even back in 92 that's where this amplifier came in now we'll erase that and kind of zoom in a little bit to what this amplifier has to do now we'll zoom into uh, a plan view of a driver's car set with a driver's compartment up here and the next car down here and the next car down here and the next car down here with a say a guard's compartment here mm -hmm. okay driver wants to talk to guard well we need an amplifier here so that the driver can address the speaker down in the guards compartment is it just speakers there's no are there headphones are there speakers no. only speakers only yep ceiling speakers got it we also uh, so we have a microphone here running into a power amplifier driving his speaker. Mm -hmm. He wants to reply. Guess what? He needs a microphone driving into a power amplifier mm -hmm. back up the same lines to his. How many lines are we talking about speaker. here? A pair to do that. Single pair? Single pair. Yep. Now the thing is it's entirely possible that if they get into a bit of an argument they're both going to be pushing their talk buttons at the same time. So it's not out. full duplex with <laughs> oh, a single no. pair. Oh no, they're both going to be talking <laughs> into each other and basically the amplifiers have to be designed to not only feed dead shorts but also mm -hmm. feed into the outputs of other amplifiers without self-destructing. That's part of the criteria. Uh, another part of the criteria is Okay, these amplifiers are run from the 120 volt battery banks previously mm -hmm. mentioned. The voltage on those battery banks can vary from, oh, well, on a bad day when they're near stony flat, they might be down at 70 volts. Mm -hmm. If they're fully charged to the point of overcharge, they might be up at 150 volts. It's a go. pretty fair What sort of charge. battery technology are we talking about? Lead acid. Lead acid, thought so. Big lead acid. But just to add insult to injury, there's rather a lot of different electromechanical bits of machinery mm. run from these 120 mm. volt batteries. They're not only used for the PA system, they're used for a plethora of other things. They're connected to inverters so that they can run the air conditioning system. So there'd be lots of dips and brownouts and all sorts there's of crap on there. There's dips, there. there's brownouts. Uh, they actually describe the spikes that they see on these lines, which extend from you know, minor over voltages of maybe 200 volts mm. for hundreds of milliseconds down to four kilovolts <laughs> for some microseconds. Oh, ouch. And State Rail actually have a list of spikes that they have observed. <laughs> So that, <laughs> and you have to design the amplifiers to accommodate. Do they have spike simulators to test that? So when you design gear like this, do you test it to their standard? They didn't. We had to create. Oh, you had to create the generators to do that. Yep. There you go. Uh -huh. Which actually is disturbingly easy. Mm. How do you do it? Pass a current through an inductor, and open circuit the inductor. 
capacitor coupler resultant spike energy onto your main mm -hmm. rail and Bob's your it's uncle. disturbingly easy to simulate. Okay. So th this is a half duplex push to torque system if I've got the terminology correct? Yes. Right. Now, on the, the this is for the intercom system, we haven't addressed the PA system yet. The intercom system can use relatively low power amplifiers mm -hmm. and in this case we are limiting the power here to 30, 35 watts. Mm -hmm. The lines connecting all of this run at nominal 100 volt levels. Yep. So it's a fairly high voltage level, very few transmission losses. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the systems that was proposed is the use of uh, passenger help points. That's right. Such that in each uh, in each passenger location, mm -hmm. you would have a help point where you could push the button and talk to crew. So that effectively overrides the crew intercom system. Yeah. Now, how does it do that? Does it give priority over the crew talking to each other it at the moment? It does. Uh -huh. It does. There you go. Now. How does it do this? When a passenger pushes their emergency button, mm -hmm. as well as connecting their little local amplifier onto that intercom line and squirting audio, which will be heard by both of these speakers, yep. it also injects a 25 kilohertz tone. Ah. That 25 kilohertz tone is detected by these power amplifiers, these species yep. here when they detect a 25k tone, they lock out other activity. Got it. So that only the uh, the passenger in, in dire straits mm. is heard. Excellent. Now, similarly, how do they reply to just him and not to that one and that one and that one and that one and that one? Because you don't want to panic the rest of the train. Exactly. Mm. Okay. These, when the crew want to reply just to that help point, mm -hmm. they press their passenger emergency intercom button and they're putting audio back down that line plus a 50 kilohertz tone. Ah. The 50 kilohertz tone is detected by only the one who's had its button recently pushed. Right. Thus, two-way communications. Recently be pushed, has it got a timeout on that? Yes. Right, got it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, the logic of all of this was fairly carefully thunked through. Right. Uh, and not only that, they can't hold their button down for any more than 30 seconds. It times out. Mm -hmm. Similarly, they can't hold their button down for more than 30 seconds. It times out. So if you get someone who likes to have a good gab on your... <laughs> yeah. <they're> just... <laughs> You're out of here. Kill yeah. switch. They're flicked off the queue. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, now, public address. Okay, all through here we've got loudspeakers spread right throughout the carriages. Now these are double deck carriages, so you've got uh, you know, maybe 10 or 20 or 30 speakers down the bottom. These are the ones you can't hear. Yep. Yeah, they're the ones that you can't hear. And there's, there's a reason for that which <laughs> we, I'll actually come we to. We will go into. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Everyone indeed. wants to know why they're crap, so we'll find yeah. out folks, stick around. <laughs> The amplifier section used for public address, mm -hmm. particularly because it might be addressing the speakers in eight carriages, sometimes up to 16 carriages, mm -hmm. much higher power, 150 watts. Right. Separate set of lines reticulated right through, again 100 volt stuff, but uh, each, of the, each of these little four inch speakers is I think tapped for about a half a watt or one mm -hmm. watt load onto that line so uh, if let's say they're tapped at half a watt it means that you can put 300 speakers onto that 150 watt amplifier right and the amplifier will treat that with perfect yep. aplomb yeah uh, once you get to maybe 400 uh, sorry once you get to maybe 200 watts worth of load on the amplifier mm -hmm. it's vi limiting i'll come to that we'll start mm -hmm. kicking in uh, but you can talk to an awful lot of speakers. Awesome. And half a watt into a little four inch speaker mm. still represents a fair amount of sound pressure level in the yep. carriage, particularly when you've got a number of such speakers. Multiple spread throughout, it'd be enough. Yeah. Okay, what kinds of problems do we have with PA systems, even on nominally working trains? Mm -hmm. There's two that I'm distinctly aware of. 
The first is that between some of the uh, middle-aged and extremely old trains, there were some compatibility problems in the links that couple the carriages together. One of those areas of incompatibility was perfectly capable of connecting 120 volts DC straight onto the PA loudspeaker lines. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch, indeed. You don't want to burn your coils out. Well, what had burned out was the all of the uh, the coupling transformers at the individual speakers. Was, yep. Until they started fitting those speakers with coupling capacitors, <laughs> so that what you wind up having is a little yep. coupling cap. Okay, this is your 100 volt rail running into a step down transformer, transformer which drives your speaker into the speaker, and you would pick the correct tapping on the transformer to give you nominally half a watt into that speaker from 100 volts there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was number one problem. Incidentally, in the earliest amplifiers, we were not made aware of this particular problem, as a result of which uh, you'll see in a minute there's a couple of toroidal transformers under here. Mm -hmm. The larger of the transformers would get 120 volts straight up it, it was sufficiently large that it would actually take quite some time to die, maybe tens of seconds. <laughs> right. During that period of tens of seconds before it ruptured, there would be a lot of smoke emitted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was after that first batch of amplifiers yeah. went into production that we were made aware of this, so we started on those first ones, fitting extra coupling capacitors on the output of the transformers so that DC mm -hmm. wouldn't affect the transformers. Later versions, such as this one, had coupling capacitors incorporated on the PCB. Got it. And note, incidentally, that they're electrolytics. They are? They are electrolytics, but they're connected back to back. Right. Yes. So it doesn't matter which way around you put your DC on it during a fault condition, <laughs> it'll still hack it. Okay, we're having a look at the back panel of this amplifier. Uh, they're all uh, XLR style connectors. Power. The output connector actually needs six connections. I'll mm -hmm. come back to that shortly. We're missing a three pin connector there for muting, which actually never got used. It was simply mm. a provision that was put in for later. Uh, this particular unit that I've got my hands on here at the moment is actually a production sample. Right. which is uh, because, let's face it, all of the working ones are rattling around in trains or sitting in depots waiting for something to break down. <laughs> okay, we've got an input here which allows uh, program input, such as maybe radio or pre-recorded messages, into the right. intercom. We have two inputs here which allow similar uh, uh, program input, pre-recorded, whatever, mm -hmm. music, Annunciations to be fed into the PA system. We also have a guard's microphone connection and a driver's microphone connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I should at this stage maybe go back to the whiteboard and discuss the overall topology of the Quite amplifier. Possibly. I'm interested in this uh, heat sink. It's a rather unusual riveted arrangement with a, what, a stabilising bar on the back? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, did, did they vibrate loose or what? Uh, well, What's the at, deal? The, at the stage that these amplifiers were designed, the company who I was working for, Jans, Jans, Jans Electronics, mm -hmm. uh, were very good at sheet metal and had excellent sheet metal uh, facilities. Uh, and it was viewed at the time to be expedient to design the heat sinks uh, from Using, sheet yep. rather than extrusion yes. or any other form. Yep. So we designed them out of uh, stacked U sections mm -hmm. with this bar across the back so that it was, made it more difficult to bend an individual yep. fin out of shape. Now also bear in mind these had to undergo almost military specification testing up to and including uh, I think it was 24 hours on a shaker table mm -hmm. and three it weeks swept through what range what's the range of vibration on a train because I know there are standard specifications for vibration for road air rail travel and in international vibration equipment standards you're pressing my memory here but I think it was of the order 5 or 10 Hertz mm -hmm. through to about 500 Hertz yep 
It sounds right. And if you give me long enough, I'll remember what the actual amplitude levels were because mm. they varied with frequency too. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so that would be a swept sign test. Yes. From th through that range, just continuous sweeping once a in ten seconds or something. Yes. Yep. And uh, there was a, a an additional pre-test where they actually went through searching for resonances mm -hmm. that were visible to the naked, naked eye. Yep. Uh, was it only tested in one axis? The mounted, the axis that was mounted on, was it tested in all I three axes? I, seriously, <laughs> I can't remember. It was 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was 20, years ago, That's literally. <laughs> okay. We're in. What we've got down there is the two toroidal output transformers. The power amplifiers, since they run from a nominal 120 volt DC supply rail, we designed them simply to be a push-pull class AB amplifier mm -hmm. run directly from 120 volts, which gives us a RMS output voltage before clip of about 35 volts. So these transformers are 35 volt to 100 volt step-up mm -hmm. transformers in 30 odd watt size and 150 watt size. And that's the one that the smoke comes out of in large quantities <laughs> when you put 120 volt DC <laughs> into the 100 volt AC side. Oops. Lots and lots of very, very solid 1.2 millimetre uh, punched steel. All mm -hmm. good solid stuff. And we can have a look at this. Okay, pretty simple wiring looms. Bucket loads of TO3 output transistors, mm -hmm. also used for voltage regulation and, and such as well. what type are they? Okay, these are MJ15024 and 15025s mm -hmm. in PN, PNP pairs, rated uh, 250 volts, 16 amps. That's a lot of cancer compound on there. Uh, well actually this is just just post the cancer <laughs> compound, compound era, yep. so these are actually zinc oxide there you go. Uh, rather than uh, beryllium oxide. Yep. Uh, I was rather disturbed at the stage that the zinc oxide uh, thermal <laughs> compounds came out. <laughs> to have a look at the MSDS sheets and discover that the LD50, in other yep. words, the dose required to kill 50% of typical human beings was in excess of 50 kilograms of that stuff. Now, we had two kilogram tubs of this, and I just had this nasty mental image of sitting down to a meal of 25 <laughs> tubs of silicone, silicone thermal grease. Uh, I, I, I think I'd die of repugnance before I actually died of thermal grease poisoning. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the non-toxic stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually come across any true beryllium stuff. Mm -hmm. However, I have, as a teenager, been up to my elbows in polychlorinated biphenyls out of uh, power factor correction capacitors. Maybe that ex goes a long way to explaining some <laughs> aspects of my behaviour. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> okay, this is real good old-fashioned earth technology. Uh, we've got op amps down here, which mm -hmm. are NE5532s. Now, in 92, these op amps were, had been out probably oh, maybe up to a decade. I can't remember mm -hmm. when the 5532s first oh, came yeah. out, but they, look, oddly enough, they're still pretty much considered to be the duck's guts with regard to uh, audio op amps. They there are? are only a few op amps that are considered superior to them. Mm -hmm. So for an old and venerable chip, they're doing all right. Uh, We've got some, uh, a couple of CMOS switches over here for routing signals to different places. Mm -hmm. What's missing here and here are, God help us, a couple of gate array logic chips. Oh, you didn't. We you did. didn't design in a GAL. We designed in a couple of GALs for the logic functions. Why on earth did you do that? This is 92, remember? Yeah. Okay, we didn't want to use micros mm -hmm. because particularly back then, uh, micros, un unless you knew that they were going to be regularly rebooted, there was always the risk that they'd get uh, just sent off into a loop or misbehave in some fashion. Yep. Unrecoverably. Exactly. Now, the alternative would have been to use quite a smearing of 4000 series CMOS chips. 
<laughs> which with the benefit of hindsight would have been a vastly superior solution because the logic combinations we've got down here really aren't that difficult. No, I wouldn't uh, think so because you can't do much in a gal. Ultimately, you save, you might save five or a 10 chips or something. We're probably, but, we were probably you know, saving five or 10, 4,000 yeah, series yeah. CMOS chips. Yeah. Those gals proved to be the bane of our lives in later variants because the primarily the input pins started off having very, very weak pull-ups. Mm -hmm. About, I think it was one, between one and five microamps. Then they went to you know, the B and C, C. versions, mm -hmm. which had maybe 10 or 20 microamps, 20 to 50 microamps. The most recent ones that we got had more than 200 microamp pull-up. Out. And this completely stuffed some of the uh, uh, some of the analog cheating that we were doing around the game. Ah, because you can fly to the moon on a couple hundred microamps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is simply the change in uh, manufacturing technology. Mm -hmm. over, the, over the last 20 years has uh, made huge differences to the strength of the input pin internal pull-ups. Got it. Now they've also become faster, but let's face it, this is dumb switching of mic signals. We can't tell the difference between 50 nanosecond or 20 <laughs> nanosecond performance. Uh, tell it like it is, Doug. Okay. What um, else have we got on here? Okay, this is probably where we might want to have a look at, first of all, a system architecture drawing. Let's do the topology. And then uh, uh, we'll go to a circuit diagram. We have circuit diagrams. We have circuit diagrams. Beautiful. 30-watt amplifier going through a transformer. Okay. In Whenever the amplifier is unpowered, what we want is for the, uh, let's call that the circulating uh, intercom line throughout the train. Mm -hmm. We want that to be switched to, uh, I'll just draw a, a relay here. In the off state, we want it to be switched here to the local speaker. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Doug's okay. had a 20 year brain fart, folks. <laughs> okay. So we have here a local speaker in the crew compartment. Uh, we, we actually need two relays here. Uh, I'll just draw them in place and figure out what they do later. Doesn't have to be accurate. We can have yeah. stick figures. Yeah, uh, this will be sticky. This will be very, very sticky. In the off state, we want that local, uh, sorry, that circulating intercom line to go nowhere. Mm -hmm. We want that speaker to be dead. When it's powered on, we want that to switch down and allow that speaker to be connected to the intercom line. So mm -hmm. that if uh, if there's somebody occupying it, occupying the, the crew compartment, so that relay's energised, any audio coming through on the intercom line gets heard. And then, of course, if we hit a push to talk switch on a microphone, we engage that one. So that we send the amplifier output onto the intercom line. Yeah. Got it. So far, so good. What have we got over here? We've got a guard's microphone. We've got a driver's microphone. He has three switches associated with him. Okay, guard. And driver. He also has three switches associated with him because the guard sits in a different place to the driver. Yep. Even when the driver's up the front, he's in the driver's seat. When the guard's down the back, he's in the little guard's compartment. Mm -hmm. The driver's compartment and the guard's compartment might be next to each other. Yeah. They've still got their own microphones and their own places. Got it. Okay, so he could address PA intercom or passenger emergency intercom. The driver too can address PA intercom or passenger emergency intercom. Okay, these are just uh, switch signals from mm -hmm. a box. Now, this is the other aspect about poor quality announcements. The microphones for the guard and the driver are dynamic microphone capsules 
embedded behind perforated steel mesh. Right. Okay, so picture we've got these little microphone uh, capsules with diaphragm there, mounted behind stainless steel with mm -hmm. a bunch of holes there. Okay, when you're uh, talking into that, there's a fair amount of low pass filtering applied to the speech by those holes. Oh, okay. Due to the diameter of the, yeah. based on the diameter and the pattern into, and the... Yeah. Now, why are we doing that? To mm -hmm. try and make them, well, not vandal proof, there's no such thing, but vandal resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been told anecdotally, and I'm still not certain if this is true or not, and I don't want to offend too many train drivers and guards, we've been told that some crew are, they've got time on their hands, they're bored, they're irritable, and if they can break something on the train, then they don't have to use that something on the train. Uh -huh. yeah. So they've actually almost got a vested interest in trying to make things not work. Mm -hmm. So, and also there's the possibility that if members of the public get into these compartments, they mm -hmm. can wreak damage. So we made these as bulletproof as we could, but at the expense of frequency response. So <laughs> the frequency response of the mic capsules might once have been kind of vaguely flat, <laughs> but now look more like that. At what sort of frequency were we talking about? Oh, roll couple, off. A couple of hundred hertz. A couple of hundred hertz roll yeah. off. So. The, the human speech goes up to three kilohertz nominal. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and indeed the response, the basic response, the basic response of the power amplifiers here mm -hmm. are 100 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. So the power amps are quite wide band, mm -hmm. and indeed the various other inputs that I showed you here for program material, they are unshaped. They're allowed to be flat up to 15 yeah. kilohertz, and yep. they're capable of pretty high quality reproduction. So in theory, they could play music on the train no problems at all they could and you'd hear that but then you'd get next stop central or station to whoop whoop just so <laughs> so this is why the internal preamps down here mm -hmm. have shaped response with a frequency response like that to correct for the deficits here so in principle as long as the person speaking is within about oh, maybe 200 millimetres of their panel, mm -hmm. you should be perfectly capable of getting quite good enunciation, quite good clarity mm -hmm. over the PA speakers. Now, back in 92 through to about 96, I understand that State Rail was actually getting their guards and their drivers and putting them through a form of elocution lessons. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they apparently had little booths set up where they would re uh, record the person speaking, play it back to them for correction and <laughs> amendment. And I believe at that time, uh, speech quality and comprehension were really very good. Mm. And it has slipped and slipped and slipped since then. It's not much wonder that, uh, uh, because there's not a lot of attention paid to this side of things at mm. the moment, that you know the, the, the crew don't necessarily know that they have to speak into the, the, the grill panel instead of speaking off to one side. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not. So they've got their head half hanging out the door while they're trying to make the announcement. Yep. Mm. Uh, interestingly, on some of the diesel car sets, which are which run interstate and mm -hmm. out of the country, the announcements are made with a handset or handheld microphone, mm -hmm. and results apparently are much clearer. Right. because of the fact that they're using a close mic technique. Mm -hmm. I think that the crews on those runs are considered to be you know, a cut above and you therefore don't have to vandal proof it quite as much. Right. What's, what's the truth of that? I don't know. Seriously don't know. The mic preamps have frequency response shaping. Uh, we've got all of these various switches so that the mic, the output of the mic preamp can be gated through to the intercom amplifier or mm -hmm. to the uh, PA amplifier to be sent out to the global PA line. Uh, so that switch will kind of run 
that one, one that yep. electronic switch there, that one will run that one. And if they are using that one, it not only gates that through, but it also gets the local uh, 25 kilohertz oscillator and gates it through too. And, they, and that. that's just summed onto the signal? and Summed onto the signal. That's it. Okay, you have to do that a few times. Uh, yeah. But you said the bandwidth of this was only 15 kilohertz? Yeah. Uh, for, for speech. For speech. Yeah. Right. Uh, the actual bandwidth of the power amplifier itself is intrinsically much higher. We do Got the it. limiting back in the preampy side of things. Uh, yeah, uh, we're actually pushing, sorry, 50 kilohertz out here. And uh, we figured in the system we'd get these ones to talk at 50 kilohertz because mm -hmm. we've got enough power here and enough grunt to do those relatively high frequencies well. Right. The passenger help points talking back, we're getting them to do that at only 25 kilohertz mm -hmm. because they're lower power, they're feebler, we're not asking too much of them. Right. Now, incidentally, at the moment, <coughs> I seriously do not know whether that particular tone signalling system is being used for the help points or whether they've gone to use the, uh, how do you put it, the digital data path that's apparently a part of right. the most recent. linking signs, the display signs yes. and stuff like that. That's an unknown to me. Right. Uh, yeah, well, let's face it, my knowledge is, okay, this is, these are designed 20 years ago, yep. my knowledge is probably 12 years old. Yeah. So the hardware's still there, but whether or not they're using it and... Unknown. Yep. And part of what the gate array logic chips were doing was deciding who had priority. Okay, lowest right. priority, of course, was these uh, program inputs. Mm -hmm. uh, next priority was uh, things like the, the PA mics. Mm -hmm. Next priority was intercom, and highest priority was the passenger emergency gear. Come on, you need the gate array for that? That's gilding the lily. Uh, look, it was thought to be a good idea at the time, and it probably was because it shrunk our, you know, maybe eight or ten chip solution and a whole bunch of passives. Mm. Because uh, for the, that kind of thing, I would have used uh, probably diode resistor logic for of a course. lot of this. Yeah. Uh, it shrunk maybe a, yeah, a six or eight or ten chip solution down to two chips. Yeah. So that was thought to be a, a good thing at the time. Yeah, minimise the amount of hardware. And you came to regret it. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. <sighs> uh, there's a lot of other decisions that were made here that have proven over the period of time to be absolutely spot on. Uh, Tell us about them. Well, things like uh, <laughs> we've got probably three times as many output transistors as are actually needed. Mm -hmm. uh, They're just in parallel? Uh, yep. Yep. This is where we probably want to go to the circuit diagram, but for example, the 150 watt amplifier has three pairs mm -hmm. of these beasties. Uh, now, ordinarily out of three pairs of those, you would probably get a three or 400 watt RMS rock and roll amplifier. Yep. Okay. Which you've designed many of. <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James uh, did a lot more than... Uh, Train carriage amplifiers. Yeah, this was an oddball project for Jans, which mm -hmm. is why uh, I think around about 96 or thereabouts they decided not to support these anymore. Mm. How many uh, amps did you design at Jans? Oh, all of them? Uh, during, during the period you were there? Uh, all, of the, all, of the, all of them during the period that I was there. There's two that I did not design, uh, which are the First of all, the J300 and the J600, which were pretty much the first power amplifiers that Jans uh, manufactured, and they manufactured a lot of those. Mm -hmm. They were almost a copy of the Phase Linear 700. Okay. The next ones along were the J1000 and the J700. They're an amplifier which almost sent Jans broke. Why so? They had some uh, fundamental design problems, some of them electronic but most of them simple mechanical stuff related to cooling and connection. The designer at the time uh, didn't seem to be able to get a good grip on how to fix the problems. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, field failure rates were of the order 10%. Oh, that's, that's a lot. huge. Yeah. Yep. And seriously, it just about since Jans broke. You know, they just, in the middle of doing nothing, they just go, ah, boom. 
And apparently they sounded pretty much like that. <laughs> I, 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 I heard one do it <laughs> at a gig, and it's just saying like, Vah, poo. that was it. Um, so lots and lots and lots of output devices later. Mm. Uh, the designer at the time, like I said, didn't seem to have a good handle on how to rectify it. Mm -hmm. uh, I came up with a whole bunch of incremental improvements, each yep. one of which did its bit to get them back online. So at the end of the day, we had a set of solutions, you know, an, outli an outlifier would come in, we'd apply mm. the set of solutions, go out and have re reasonable confidence it would survive. Got it. Uh, at that time, I'd just gotten my degree, 1983. Uh, the designer left, or was pushed, I don't know which. Uh, Jan said, hey, Doug, do you want the job? I said, yeah, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and that's when I started designing power amplifiers. And the Jan's uh, S920 was my first one. Mm -hmm. Weighed a ton. I mean, it, it was a 450 watt per channel amplifier. <laughs> and grossly over-designed when it came to the heat sinking, the transformers, they weighed a ton. Well, actually, I think that they weighed something like uh, 22 kilo. He rode his love, you, I bet. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, once they got their compo for their backs, they did. Um, but the thing is, they were reliable. They just mm. didn't break. Yep. Uh, as far as I know, there's still 920s. Uh, Power amplifiers in rock and roll go through a sequence, or, or they mm. did when I was there. The newest amplifiers were bought by the cream of the crop touring outfits mm -hmm. for hire, and sometimes by cream of the crop bands who happen to have their own PA systems. Now these days most bands yep. just won't own a PA system, mm -hmm. they don't want them, they just want to hire them. So they start off blowing to these uh, prestige touring companies. After maybe three years in service, three touring mm -hmm. seasons, uh, the touring companies don't want to bother about you know, the, the, the seams that are starting to, the mm -hmm. folded seams that are starting to just rip a little bit, the little bits of corrosion that are starting to creep in onto the connectors, yeah. the components that are just starting to rattle a little, they don't want to have to tighten up the mounting screws on the transistors, so they sell them to the next tier down and buy them out. <laughs> Best crop. Okay, so these amplifiers go to the next tier down who are hiring out to all of your little pub bands, right. etc. Once they've done a few seasons there and they're really starting to get <laughs> that, 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 that kicked around look, <laughs> then they go to maybe a quiet <laughs> retirement in a practice studio somewhere uh, where the local punk bands are just beating the living snot out of them, but they're not actually moving them around much. Got it. Okay, so they're being caned, but they're not being physically punished. Mm -hmm. And after a while there, maybe they'll go into somebody's home recording system and just mm -hmm. mould it there for a decade or so. Uh, and that's that's what happens to old amplifiers. So. Old amplifiers. Uh. Yeah. Mind do, you. do they eventually get binned? I'm sure they must, but... <laughs> <laughs> you wind up in someone's yeah. basement somewhere yeah. driving. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know what happens to a lot of this pro gear at end of life. Mm. Uh, some of it, I think, just gets too old. Uh, mixing mm -hmm. consoles especially. Mixing mm -hmm. consoles are nasty. They're full of pots and knobs. Lots of pots that have to be... There's full-time pot jockeys, isn't there? They go around and replace the, the pot. Is that the yeah. correct term? Pot jockey or something? Oh, close enough. Sold a jockey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, no, a pot jockey is somebody <laughs> who sells your green stuff at a pub. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mixing consoles and lighting control consoles can be an absolute mongrel because mm. quite often it costs more to replace all of the pots that have gotten scratchy yep. than it does to buy a new console. Mm. That's it. So I think there's a lot of mixing consoles that die premature deaths mm -hmm. you know, before things like power amplifiers do. So we've got three relays here. Were, was vibration an issue in... Absolutely it realize. was. <laughs> oh, yes. So I picked it, did I? <laughs> yeah, because, okay, see how they're well and truly uh -huh. tied down. Okay, that was of vital importance. But there's a socket there in sockets there. Yes. Are sockets more trouble than they're worth in a high vibration environment for a relay? It's proven not to be so. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Now, w one of the things we were very 
uh, conscious of, I think, is the fact that, okay, the relays are a weak link. They're an electromechanical component. They're one of the components more liable to failure than others. Mm -hmm. In fact, the relays have proven to be ridiculously reliable. Wow. Uh, I think... What brand are they? Uh, I think we were using Omron. Omrons, yep. yep. Uh, but we're uh, actually we're using two different brands. I think Omron and Finder. Okay. Actually, if you give me two seconds, I'll tell you what uh, yeah, they're Omrons. Yep, they're definitely Omrons. But uh, uh, what we found, well, we didn't want to solder the relays directly onto the PCB uh -huh. because if they were to be less reliable, reliable, then it made replacement an absolute bastard. <laughs> By socketing them, we might be making a rod for our own back and reducing the inherent reliability simply by socketing them, but that yep. was a better risk. The, it was the, a better trade-off than that. was a risk trade-off. Yep, exactly. And particularly given that uh, we weren't entirely sure about the relative reliability of relay on PCB versus socketed mm -hmm. relay, we opted you to go socketed relay. Just go for the socket. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, they've proven to be very reliable. Would, would these things get hot? Were dried out caps an issue? Ah, uh, no. Well, yes and no. It's one of the things we made allowance for. Mm -hmm. We knew what the highest operating ambient temperature was going to be, and mm -hmm. I think it was uh, 55C mm -hmm. ambient. We knew the degree of maximum self-heating within the chassis, which incidentally is why we've, uh, it's got these huge number of vent holes on the lid and around right. the side. Yep. Uh, so I think that the internal temperature went. Was there through. ventilation there as the train moved? No. No. It right. Was, it's uh, in a sealed uh, compartment. Uh, not quite sealed, sealed but, but there was no active blow through. So we right. were relying on just natural convection mm -hmm. for both uh, heat sink cooling mm -hmm. and also chassis cooling. Got it. <clears throat> so just from memory, the uh, we knew that the maximum operating temperature for the caps was going to be something like 65 or 70. Mm -hmm. uh, we used 105 degree capacitors. With the electrolytic capacitors, I got it from the horse's mouth, one of the head honchos at Nippon Chemicon, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the Arrhenius coefficient or the coefficient to use in the Arrhenius equation for capacitor lifespan uh -huh. was double or half the lifespan per 10 degree increase or decrement. That's always been the rule of it's thumb, been but the rule it of is thumb, confirmed. But I've actually had it confirmed, confirmed. by right. one of the head honchos from Nippon Chemical, and that was kind of cool to have. So increase it by 10 degrees and you can kiss half your life goodbye. Yep. So in the case of 105 degree cap, go mm -hmm. down from 105 to 95, 85, 75, mm -hmm. and that's two for eight times the lifespan mm -hmm. of a 5,000 hour, hour cap, cap. 40,000 hours. Bang. Now, in actual fact, we knew that uh, because of cyclical operation and mm -hmm. you know, they're never going to sit there no. for, incidentally, the lifespan had to be 50,000 hours. We knew that they were never going to sit there at 70 degrees or whatever mm -hmm. for 50,000 hours. Yep. It was inherent that with cycling of mm -hmm. seasons, etc., etc., and especially the fact that they were not going to be used at 100% duty cycle for speech. Yep. They were never going to sit there baking at that temperature. So they infinite almost. Yeah. The and life and shelf life of the product. <coughs> yeah. And look, over 20 years, how many electrolytics have I replaced? Mm -hmm. None. None. <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, uh, mind you, this is uh, we've used Nippon Chemicon caps, and I guess the two brands of cap that I tend to prefer, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, are Nippon Chemicon or United Chemicon, some yep. do, uh, and uh, Panasonic. Yes, uh, I've had very good results from both of those. Both uh, are the duck's guts. There's a few capacitors that I would not touch with a barge pole. I just did a video on that. Oh, okay. The caps on all over the place wherever we've got capacitors, uh, electrodes, it's going yep. to be Nippon Chemicon. Uh, for, got, yep. for a lot of the smaller stuff, these ones, and also all of these little red fellas here, they're Wema. Yep. Uh, and again, in, in that class of capacitor, uh, Wema are considered to be pretty good. They are. Not necessarily duck scuts, but pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to little ceramic stuff, uh, we didn't care. No. <laughs> it's like, eh, hey, whatever. 
whatever uh, the Chinese factory can yeah, churn out. As long as they were COG or NPO dielectric, yep. and as long as the voltage rating was hugely in excess of what was required, pff, that was all that was required. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these are high voltage? Uh, these ones are actually mains rated. Yes, so Just they're self healing, self healing dielectric. They are. Yep. Uh, we've actually had to replace a couple of those, but the main reason for failure is because in the environment that these are used, just occasionally, or more than occasionally, we will get a leak of carriage wash fluid. Now this carriage wash fluid, we still don't know whether it's intensely acid or intensely alkaline, but it is intense. And it just, anything that it touches, it just stuffs completely. And it's all, the, it's all the worse if you actually have voltage on whatever this stuff drips onto. Ouch. And here's one we prepared earlier. Earlier. Let's have a look. <sighs> Let's put that one to one side. Okay. Let's have a look at that. That is toasty, folks. That, look at that. We are huh. talking roasty toasty indeed. Now, we've had a drip of or a leak of wash fluid down here and we've obviously had a resultant arcs across the top of the circuit board that have etched through the circuit board while self-perpetuating as arcs and it's just completely chewed that section of the PCB away. Ouch. Over on the far side of the PCB here you can see the results on around the legs of these Preamp chips here of just small amounts of mm. surface wash fluid. Now, all Ouch. of this stuff is low voltage, it's 12 volts. Mm -hmm. Over on the other highly damaged end of the PCB, we've got uh, full 120 volt levels. So, uh, yeah, this wash fluid has been responsible for, I think, maybe three quarters of the repairs that we've needed to do. I notice you've got some uh, snot in there. Ah, yeah. Why have we snotted those down? Vibration? Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, a lot of these components, such as the capacitors, we've joined to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a sort of self-support society. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it, means that <laughs> it makes it that much harder for any one to start uh, developing a wobble, wobble or a shake and breaking through its own leads. Yep. Incidentally, you will notice around these resistors that we've got little holes, or actually not so little holes, oh, under them. all of the resistors. Are they ventilation? They are. Yep. The resistors are slightly spaced above the PCB, or actually mm -hmm. they should be, they're not well, on this particular one. This, this is a pre-production. <laughs> uh, uh, no, this one's actually a production oh. unit. The, the other one was the production sample. Uh, these should by rights be spaced up a little. Um, are you a fan of doing the little loop in the lead to de-stress the, when they expand due to temperature? Uh, no, I'm a fan of doing the it lead. That's some inductor, right? That's some inductor. Oh, <laughs> look, <laughs> You're just actually, creating an inductor. Look, again, a note for audio fools. Anybody who's silly enough to worry about a couple of tens of nanohenries of stray inductance in their low value emitter resistors <laughs> is a bloody loony. Seriously, it makes no difference. It adds a small amount of degeneration. Does it affect the stability of your amplifier? Well, if it does, you've done a pretty good, pretty crook job of designing a power amplifier. Exactly. Okay, what I am a fan of with regard to resistors is doing a bit of shaping on the legs. Okay. Simply so that when you drop the resistor in the holes, it, it self spaces. It self spaces, yeah. yep. Not so much for stress reduction or any of that stuff, mm -hmm. but any of your large components such as these 5 watt resistors yep. and sometimes the 1 watters, these fellas down oh, here. Okay. Yep. Uh, I like to see, and in fact I have a pair of uh, leg crimpers that put that shape in to space them. Got it. And it's, yeah, it's a nicety. On the downside, because your component is stood up off the circuit board, it does leave it, it prone to rock and roll. Which is where, where you, you, <laughs> you whack your elastic on to fix it. <laughs> and here's the schematic. You've done well. Is it on one sheet, Doug? Uh, yes. And bear in mind, 
because this was done back in 92, this was drawn up in uh, Protel Schematic. Uh, Pro sorry, Protel Schema. DOS. Uh, DOS. DOS, DOS. Yep. yes. Okay, let's have a look first of all at just one power amplifier. And this is a That's power a amplifier here. Yep. Yep. Okay, we've got an input long tail pair, differential pair with a small amount of resistor, uh, so, sorry, small amount of emitted degeneration. Current through the long tail pair is set by this resistor to ground. Ordinarily we, we might have, mm -hmm. say, a current source in there, but a current source is gilding the lily on something like this. The... Because we only want to go to central. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. <laughs> uh, okay, the, <laughs> the output of the, uh, oh, sorry, the long tail pair is differencing, okay, the non-inverting input here of actual signal mm -hmm. and the negative feedback here, which is 330K into 6K2. Oh, now, for AC, it's 330K into 6K2. For DC, it's 330K into 6K2 plus 100K. Mm -hmm. This means that uh, for 60 volts, there, we're expecting maybe about 15 volts there, and indeed the bias for here is from a 15 volt reference mm -hmm. derived by the 47k resistor from the 120 volt rail and 6k2 down here. Meh. Okay, so uh, another diff pair up here to give us our different signals. Uh, this is our voltage amplifier stage here, uh, so that's basically a mirror. Mm -hmm. Okay, we then have MJE 340 and 350 pre-drivers, MJE 340 and 350 drivers, MJE 15024 and 025 output stage. Got it. Output from this point here goes to uh, coupling capacitors and into the output transformers. We'll trace that through in a second. One of the most important points is the uh, output limiting, the short circuit protection. Output current here mm. comes down through those two emitter resistors, which in this case are one ohm. We use the voltage sensed across those resistors to, well, if, if the voltage across there is high enough, it starts turning on these transistors, Got it. which shorts drive away from the pre-drivers down to there, or away from this drive down to there. How much distortion does something like that add if we're talking about like a hi-fi? Would, would you do that on a rock and roll amp? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, well, it's, it's essential, of course. <laughs> yes. The whole point is you design all of the circuitry around these VI limiters mm -hmm. so that it simply does not take any action during normal operation. So if you've designed a power amplifier to run, say, a four ohm speakers, mm -hmm. you would typically not have those take ac action until the impedance drops below, say, 2.7 ohms. Got it. Or maybe below 2.7 ohms plus 2.7 R reactive. Mm -hmm. Or, two, sorry, 2.7 J no. reactive. Yeah. Uh, so that normal reactive loads that you might in encounter in speakers just mm -hmm. have no effect. But yep. as soon as you start getting serious overloads, which are enough to really stress your output devices, or incidentally, of course, you have to size your output devices so that they will cope with normal loads. No. Duh. That's <laughs> where... Thunk. Yeah, who to thunk it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so once you... <laughs> you have an issue with fake transistors uh, in the day. No, we didn't. Uh, they just didn't bother to fake these ones, or you just were lucky mm, enough not to get caught out? I think it was a little bit of both. I think that whoever was supplying our devices at the time uh, were getting them from the horse's mouth, Yep. Uh, which was uh, Motorola, Motorola, who then became on semi. That's right. Uh, for a while, we were using some devices, I think EB203 and ED203, from a manufacturer called Hyrel, oh. uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese, I believe. Mm -hmm. They were the moral equivalents of these fellas here, similar bandwidth, similar voltage, similar current, similar gain structure, yada, yada, yada. Uh, all same poo. Got it. Uh, 
So that's the, you know, that, that's the, the power that's amp stage. power amp. Section. Uh, what else have we got? Another power amplifier, oddly enough. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, you will see here that uh, this output rail comes down here through a big coupling capacitor, 470 mic, into our output transformer. Mm -hmm. The output transformer, well, look, if, you, if you're that desperate, yes, you can trace through all of this relay yeah. line bullshit, but who cares? Uh, one of the items that you might be interested in having a look at, though, is that op amp there. I was going to ask about that one, yes. Okay, it's having a sniff of signal going into the VAS, the mm -hmm. voltage amplifier stage. Now, while ever the power amplifier is acting within closed loop conditions, mm -hmm. there's going to be very, very little signal there. Yep. But as soon as it falls out of closed loop conditions, due to either clipping yep. or short circuit limiting or uh, well, actually, th those are the two main right. conditions, clipping and short circuit limiting. Uh, there's going to be a lot of signal appears there. Amplifier, put it through a rather crude half wave rectifier, uh, feed it down into that lead there, and, and you've got a short circuit indicator. Clip lead. Eh. Yep. Bingo. Too easy. Duplicated over here. Yep. Too crude, too easy, too simple. So is this second stage an absolute duplicate of the first? Looks uh, almost identical. Almost identical. The main difference is, whereas this one had one pair of uh, output transistors. Oh yes, there we go, we've got a couple. This one's got, uh, well actually, we've got uh, this time, this one had little pre-drivers, mm -hmm. little drivers, big outputs. Yep. Here, we've got little pre-drivers, big drivers and big outputs. Got it. And part of the reason for that is we're, we were actually configured the big drivers to contribute a fair bit to directly to the output. And you've got a, um, a couple of uh, four, one in 4007s on the output. Yeah, the reason for those is if the VI limiting kicks in while the amplifier is driving a heavily inductive load, well, let's face it, inductors hate to have the current to them interrupted. You try and interrupt the current to an inductor, and the voltage is going to fly to one rail or another. So we catch that to either the positive rail or yep. to ground. The diodes don't have to be particularly huge because the amount of energy involved isn't no. particularly high. No, that's right. Yep. So even though, let's face it, we've got some 50 amps worth of output device here, we've got one amp worth of diode yeah. there, and it suffices. Just yeah. fine and dandy. Yeah. Right. Uh, another little bit of circuitry over here. We've got an LM35 temperature sensor, which is mm -hmm. uh, a fundamental part of the heatsink. We're sniffing its temperature. When it gets to 80 degrees, in other words, if ventilation's really sadly blocked mm -hmm. off for some reason, if the heatsink gets to 80 degrees, we mute the PA system. Got it. But we let the intercom system keep on going mm -hmm. until it hits some 85 degrees and at that stage we decide okay enough's yep. enough let's kill the whole shooting match got it so we've got a progressive shutdown Down. yep that's rather clever uh, well this is the if you like the the pre, the pre signal steering -y bit yep. These are where all of the various switches, you know, the guards, intercom switch, mm -hmm. drivers, intercom switch, these are the switch contacts. They're dirty great big industrial push buttons, nothing mm -hmm. fine or dainty about these. No. So we wanted to have quite high uh, voltage switching levels on these. So we pull those switch contacts high to plus 120 volts with 47K resistors, mm -hmm. and we switch those to ground with the actual switches. Yep. Uh, we then use the transistors within ULN 2003s uh, to detect what the level there is, whether it's high, low, or indifferent, and to Usually act as. Usually, these are drivers. These are Darlington pair drivers. That's right. We're simply using them as uh, <laughs> transistors. Logic input <laughs> buffers, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah logic trans in. logic level translators, maybe. Huh. <laughs> 120 volt to 5 volt logic translators. Look, call them what you will. Okay. Overkill again, Doug. Yeah, okay, gross overkill, but it means that we can have kilovolt transients on those lines, right. 
and it doesn't matter, nothing dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we've even got a bit of switch debounce in there. Yeah, not a whole lot, but enough. Terrific. Now comes the ugly bit where we get all of those 5 volt logic levels and we feed them into the gate array logic chips. Oh, Good fail. Our little, yeah, okay, dismal yeah. fail. Uh, I'm disappointed yeah. in you, Doug. <laughs> oh, shush. Uh, <laughs> including... You're an analog man. Yeah. Uh, mind you, uh, between you and me and the gate post, I was dragged into this side of things, kicking and screaming. And in fact, it was, I think, Peter Godwin at Jans who did the logic, uh, what do you call it, the logic equations required for these and programmed them in. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay, including, we've got a, an oscillator over here, which we tune up to 50 kilohertz. So oh, LM567. Yep. Uh, now you can use these LM567s as either uh, oscillators mm -hmm. or down here as a tone decoder, a yep. sniffer. They are, 567 is the classic tone decoder IC. Mm -hmm. That's what it's famous for. We also use them as a precision oscillator. There Incidentally, you go. getting these amplifiers back, you know, 18 and 20 years after manufacture, we discover, for example, that the 50 kilohertz oscillators have maybe drifted 250 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz over that period of time. Is that a drama? No. Because the tone <laughs> decoder can capture, it has a wider capture bandwidth yes. than that. Right. Yeah, the, but uh, that's a credibly small range and generally not due to chip drift, but of course due to capacitor and resistor drift. Yeah. Yep. Okay, now. That's all the boring bit. Now let's come over here to what happens at each of our various inputs. The inputs are balanced mm -hmm. configuration so that they reject common mode noise and only respond to differential input, yep. which is exactly what you want. Okay, we've got bridge rectifiers here so that extreme transients present there just get clamped to the supply rails mm -hmm. through the bridge rectifier. Balanced amplifier. Now, in these early versions, God help us, we're using JFETs <laughs> for audio switching and Nobody gating. Nobody uses JFETs for anything anymore, <laughs> do they? Uh, yes, yes. Name a niche. Uh, one of the best possible niches is, of course, the uh, input buffer amplifiers to condenser microphones. Uh. Yeah, uh, condenser microphone pre-amplifiers where mm -hmm. you want staggeringly low leakage currents and staggeringly high input impedances mm -hmm. and staggeringly low parasitic capacitances. Got it. And that's what I did for crusted road microphones. Mm -hmm. Either that's that- a whole nother story. Yeah, either that or I used JFETs with pilot lights, oh. also known as like and triodes. Tu tubes. <laughs> yeah, tubes. <laughs> Tubes. tubes. No, tubes. Tubes with a C-H? Yeah, C-H-O-O-B-S. <laughs> tubes. Oh, boy. So, okay, we're audio switching there with JFETs and spitting them out into the two mixing amps to go out of the two power amplifiers. Uh, well... That's it. Oh, and the, no. only, the only particularly interesting thing here is where we're getting the, uh, uh, the intercom line Mm -hmm. doing a whole stack of high-pass and low-pass filtering and buffering and then sending it into this detector for 25 kilohertz. That's, our, that's our tone decoder, and yep. Whose output then goes back into the gate array logic chip. So right. there you go. That's your lot. That's it. That's it. That is the Sydney Rail. What is it? What's uh, it called? It's well, a PA. It, it's a PA uh, crew intercom <laughs> amplifier. PA Crew Intercom Amplifier for City Rail. Everyone hates City Rail. Yeah, yeah. and not only that, but apparently there have been uh, court cases brought recently to uh, State Rail because of the paucity of PA announcements. Uh, there's court cases. Some people didn't. Some some lawyer yeah. missed his stop. Uh, and decide to sue him? No, some uh, blind fellow, oh. sight impaired, uh, has, he's been catching the train for decades and he's got the irrits because quite often they just don't bother announcing the they stations. They skip them and, yep. Yeah. And 
being blind, he's got no real way of looking out the window to see where he's at. Fair call. Yeah. And look, good on him. Yep. Uh, look, I want to see these things used more. <laughs> <laughs> Next off, Central. Thanks, Mr. Walker. <laughs> uh, come on, Doug, you must cop it all. Mind the doors, so please. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. announcements are so yeah. bad. Enunciation, please, guys. Enunciation. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dougie. Yeah. Speak like I say you should, not the way I speak. That's it. That was an interesting teardown. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, maybe I'll, somebody will bring in something else vaguely industrial in nature for you to have a look at one day. Sweet. Put the word out. Catch you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>